Cosmonaut uh, Sergei Avdeyev joining us today. Sergey, thank you so much for your time. Uh, you are, to this day, the most recent human to spend a year or more in space, having accomplished that feat uh, of 380 days in space uh, between August 1998 and August 1999. What were the major highlights of that year in space and uh, the low points of that marathon mission that you spent aboard the Mir space station? Uh, my flight was not unique, it was not the only one, uh, one year long flight, I mean, uh, prior to my flight, uh, Valery Polyakov flew right before me, and then there was even another flight, even earlier than that, uh, Musa Manarov and Vladimir Kito, and each of those three super long flights was different from another one. But the previous two flights before mine uh, were such that the crews actually knew all along that they're going to be flying a one-year mission. In my case, it was different. Uh, realistically, I came to know about the nature of this flight, the duration of this flight, already being on orbit, on the ground, prior to the flight. There were negotiations and discussions regarding the actual status of the uh, uh, MIR uh, station program, but the decision was not made as to which sequence we are going to entertain when it comes to you know, flying on a station. I was prepared that my flight might turn out to be a little bit longer, but I never thought that it will be twice as long. And moreover, I came to know about that, not even from uh, the people on the ground, not from the mission control center folks, but I, I came to know about that from the crew that arrived on orbit to replace um, my first uh, half of the uh, expedition. Actually, namely, it was uh, French cosmonaut Jean-Pierre Aignere, and he told me, you know, French uh, space agency was thinking to fly for about a month, but recently, all of a sudden, it turned out that it's going to be a full-blown flight, six months. And that was the difference between my flight, flight and the flights that took place earlier and the one that is coming up in soon. For those of us uh, here on Earth who are not astronauts or cosmonauts, uh, spending a year in space uh, seems to be a very daunting task. How challenging was your mission of spending a year or more in space and how much of your mission was designed to acquire information about the long duration effect of weightlessness on the human body? Uh, when it comes to impact of the weightlessness on a human body, probably uh, the, the mankind knows like 80% of what uh, uh, the entire amount of information that is available. The information is still being gathered, uh, the analysis is still going on, it's underway, even the results of my flight are under assessment e even now. As for the singularities and peculiarities of this flight, um, as far as what recommendations I can give to cosmonauts and mostly uh, management, the people who are in charge of developing those programs, it's necessary to be extremely conscientious about several uh, problems. When it comes to pure physiology, we every day exercise, uh, we run physical exercises, we uh, uh, stretch muscles, we take care of our bones, and over the course of one year, we are supposed to uh, stay fit, which is not an easy task. You may get tired. You just uh, may hate the idea of exercising, and you are sort of forced to skip a training session. Next time, you may feel totally different. You might be so energetic, you're going to 
uh, get in there right then and as a result you may damage your muscle for instance and it's going to take a month for this to heal which makes the overall situation even worse so in this regard it's necessary to be extremely reasonable and rational another aspect is uh, socio-psychological in fact cosmonauts who fly to space they uh, accept the entire sequence of events prior to flight in such a way that a month before there is a huge crowd of people that surrounds the crew members at all times there are festive atmosphere press conferences but the closer they get to the to getting on the rocket the fewer people have an access to the crew and at the very end they uh, go through the meeting of the uh, government commission and then they get into a suit up area where they don the spacesuits and then only two uh, crew members sit right next to each other and eventually the uh, last person who closes the hatch behind them. So the actual flight never starts uh, when the rocket blasts off. But way prior, when the person who is so much immersed and submerged in the training, he gets oblivious to what is going on around him. And then he flies up. And I, uh, I could talk about crew members participating in this flight, but I wanted to say a couple of words about the crew on the ground that supported that flight. It was the flight as part of the program Euromir uh, 95. It was supposed to last six months, but it was different in a sense that for the first time we've started working uh, with our foreign partners, foreign cosmonauts, in an equal kind of manner, in a reciprocal manner. And Thomas Reiter was uh, getting ready to fly with us for the entire amount of time, not for 10 days, not for two weeks, but for six months. And at the same time, Walter Peters, who uh, was the head of this uh, program on behalf of European Space Agency, currently he is the rector of uh, Strasbourg Space University, he was uh, thinking through every single tiny detail of this flight, like very minor thing, and those minor things all of a sudden used to turn out very big for us, for instance. He found a pair of glasses, very interesting glasses, and he bought them off the shelf at a regular, ordinary store. But if you look in a window in these glasses, they get darker, the lenses get darker. Then he designed a special vest for the crew members with smaller pockets with different types of uh, Velcro, and it was all done for convenience of the crew. They also conducted two different events that I still remember. On orbit, we, with their help, we managed to celebrate New Year, because at this period is very festive. It's uh, uh, Christmas, New Year's, Orthodox Christmas, so it's a stretch of holidays that equals two weeks. And all of a sudden we receive a, a gift gift, which was delivered by, by the cargo vehicle, progress vehicle. And in this gift there is a disc with the recording, basically a video. 
And this video was shot on the ground and delivered to us on, on uh, orbit. And uh, it came from Europeans, from crew, uh, ground personnel, from Cologne, all kinds of different places, mission control center, uh, all working in support of our flight, including Strasbourg, by the way, and all personnel involved in this effort in flight support extended their congratulations to, uh, to us. They used to fly up the roofs of the buildings. There were fir trees, there were colorful balloons, and it was all magnificent. Also, we received congratulations from our families, which also turned out to be very instrumental in being able to support each other and uh, create required rapport between the crew members. And I would like to wish that the upcoming flight of uh, Mikhail Karnienko and Scott Kelly would be just as successful and would be momentous not only for the crew members but also for the entire flight support personnel on the ground. With their upcoming launch, Scott Kelly and Mikhail Karnienko uh, will soon embark on spending a year aboard the International Space Station. Uh, this is the first such mission of that duration since yours. Uh, what are your thoughts on their flight uh, to gain modern day biomedical data uh, for that period of time and the benefit that that data will yield with the ultimate goal being a trip to Mars perhaps? Uh, in order to uh, uh, answer this question, let me give you the opinion of one of our medical doctors, the Russian medical doctors, experts. They, uh, on several occasions, they used to uh, state, and last time around, by the way, I heard this opinion back in Houston uh, at the Rice University as part of the medical summit. And they used to say, and they say it now, that we should not expect anything new uh, from the purely medical standpoint. We have uh, uh, the flight of Musa Manar Vladimir Titov, we have uh, the flight of uh, Valery Polyakov, uh, we have my flight, four flights altogether, tell us that from the medical standpoint we shouldn't be expecting any breakthroughs. But this is the opinion of one single medical doctor. Let him be just a physiologist. But there is also physiology, there is also psychology, there is also sociology, there is also a concept of flight control, there is a concept of reasonable performance of the mission control center, and there is uh, very many different tiny subtleties and nuances that we should be striving to get compared to what we used to have in the past, and that's, that's what my cut is on that. And finally, Sergey, what, in your opinion, um, would be the most significant challenge to accomplishing a mission to Mars, both from a physical and technical standpoint? Is a mission to Mars feasible if you had all the money in the world to do it? Is it still feasible? All projects that I have seen regarding the uh, uh, flight to Mars, if we go back to this trinity, physiology requires technical means, which are, figuratively speaking, model our planet, the Earth, our huge planet just for two, three, or up to ten crew members, but it's uh, just a replica. We need to be just as the planet of Earth. The crew needs to be protected from radiation. The crew, just as planet of Earth, is supposed to be having magnetic field. Because they, the crew, the humankind, have to be uh, protected by the magnetic field. So basically what we're going to be flying to Mars is a spacecraft called the Earth, which is very complex from every aspect. Cosmonaut Sergei Avdeyev, thank you so much for your time and insight today. Uh, we appreciate it very much and uh, good luck to you too. Thank you.
best wishes for this flight for all colleagues uh, who help them to work one year in International Space Station. Thank you. 